When we left off our story in part one, Ricky Tippy, Ricky Tiki, had come to this thorn bush and he had heard something. These sorrowful voices. Let's find out what happened. Well, it was Darcy. You know who Darcy was? He was a tailor bird and his wife. They had made this beautiful nest by pulling two big leaves together and stretching them up the edges with fibers and it filled the hollow with cotton and downy fluff. The next swayed to and fro as they sat on the rim and cried. What is the matter? asked Ricky Ticky. We are very miserable, said Darcy. One of our babies fell out of the nest yesterday and Nag ate him. Him? said Ricky Ticky. That is very sad, but I am a stranger here. Who is Nag? He asked. Darcy and his wife only cowered down in the nest without answering, for from the thick grass at the foot of the bush there came a low hiss, a horrid, cold sound that made Ricky Ticky jump back two feet clear. Oh dear. Then, inch by inch, out of the grass, rose up the head and spread hood of nag, the big black cobra. He was five feet long from tongue to tail, and he had lifted one third of himself clear off the ground. He stayed balancing to and fro exactly as a dandelion tucked balances in the wind, and he looked at Ricky Ticky with the wicked snake eyes that never change their expression, whatever the snake may be thinking of. Who is Nag, he said. I am Nag. The great god Brom put his mark upon all our people when the first cobra spread his hood to keep the sun off Brom. As he slept, look and be afraid. He spread out his hood more than ever, and Ricky Ticky saw the spectacle mark on the back of it that looked exactly like the eye part of a hook and eye fastening. He was afraid for the minute, but it is impossible for a mongoose to stay frightened for any length of time, and though Ricky Ticky had never met a live cobra before, his mother had fed him on dead ones. And he knew that all a grown mongoose's business in life was to fight and eat snakes. Nag knew that too, and at the bottom of his cold heart, he was afraid. Well, said Ricky Ticky, and his tail began to fluff up. Hmm. Do you think it is right for you to eat fledglings out of the nest? Nag was thinking to himself and watching the least little movement in the grass behind Ricky Ticky. He knew that mongooses in the garden meant death sooner or later for him and his family, but he wanted to get Ricky Ticky off his guard, so he dropped his head a little and put it on one side. Let us talk, he said. You eat eggs? Why should not I eat birds? Behind you, look behind you, sang Darcy. Ricky Ticky knew better than to waste time in stirring. He jumped up in the air as high as he could and just under him whizzed by the head of Nagena, Nag's wicked wife. She had crept up behind him as he was talking to make an end of him. Ooh. And he heard her savage hiss as he stroked as he stroke. The stroke had been an old mongoose who would have known that then it was the time to break her back with one bite. But he was afraid of the terrible lashing return stroke of the cobra. He bit indeed, but did not bite long enough, and he jumped clear of the whisking tail, leaving Nagena torn and angry. 
Wicked, wicked Darcy, said Nag, lashing up as high as he could reach toward the nest in the thorn bush, but Darcy had built it out of reach of snakes, and it only swayed to and fro. Ricky Ticky felt his eyes growing red and hot. When a mongoose's eyes grow red, he is angry, and he sat back on his tail and hind legs like a little kangaroo and looked all round him and chattered with rage. But Nag and Nagaina had disappeared into the grass. When a snake misses its stroke, it never says anything or gives any sign of what it means to do next. Ricky Ticky did not care to follow them for he did not feel sure that he could manage two snakes at once. So he trotted off to the gravel path near the house and sat down to think. It was a serious matter for him. If you read the old books of natural history, you will find that they say when the mongoose fights the snake and happens to get bitten, he runs off and eats some herb that cures him. That is not true. The victory is only a matter of quickness of eye and quickness of foot. Snakes blow against mongooses, jump. And as no eye can follow the motion of the snake's head when it strikes, that makes things much more wonderful than any magic herb. Ricky Dicky knew he was a young mongoose and it made him a little more pleased to think that he had managed to escape a blow from behind. It gave him confidence in himself. And when Teddy came running down the path, Ricky Ticky was ready to be petted. Oh, he was ready to be petted. But just as Teddy was stooping, something flinched a little in the dust, and a tiny voice said, Be careful, I am death. It was Karate, the dusty brown snakeling that lies for choice on the dusty earth, and his bite is as dangerous as the cobra's. But he is so small that nobody thinks of him. And so he does the more harm to people. Ricky Ticky's eyes grew red again, and he danced up to the crate with the peculiar rocking swaying motion that he had inherited from his family. It looks very funny but it is so perfectly balanced a gait that you can fly off from it at any angle you please. And in dealing with snakes, this is an advantage. If Ricky Ticky had only known, he was doing a much more dangerous thing than fighting Nag for Karate is so small. You can turn so, he can turn so quickly that unless Ricky bit him close to the back of the head, he would get the return stroke in his eye or lip. But Ricky Ticky did not know. No, he did not know. But his eyes were all red and he rocked back and forth, back and forth, looking for a good place to hold. Karate struck out. Ricky jumped sideways and tried to run in, but the wicked little dusty gray head lashed within a fraction of his shoulder and he had to jump over the body, and the head followed his heels close. Teddy shouted to the house. He shouted, oh, look here. Our mongoose is killing a snake. And Ricky Ticky heard a scream from Teddy's mother. His father ran out with a stick. But by that time, he came up. Parade had lunged out once too far, and Ricky Ticky had sprung, jumped on the snake's back, dropped his head far between his forelegs, bitten as high up at the back as he could get hold, and rolled away. That bite paralyzed Karate. And Ricky Ticky was just going to eat him up from the tail after the custom of his family at dinner when he remembered that a full meal makes a slow mongoose, and if he wanted all his strength and quickness ready, he must keep himself thin. He went away for a dust bath under the castor oil bushes while Teddy's father beat the dead crate. What is the use of that? thought Ricky Ticky. I have settled it all. And then Teddy's mother picked him up 
from the dust and hugged him, crying that he had saved Teddy from death. And Teddy's father said that he was a providence. And Teddy looked on with big, scared eyes. Ricky Ticky was rather amused at all the fuss, which of course he did not understand. Teddy's mother might just as well have petted Teddy for, for playing in the dust. Ricky was thoroughly enjoying himself. That night at dinner, walking to and fro among the wine glasses on the table, he could have stuffed himself three times over with nice things, but he remembered Nag and Nicana, and though it was very pleasant to be patted and petted by Teddy's mother and to sit on Teddy's shoulder, his eyes would get red from time to time, and he would go off into his long war cry of Ricky Ticky Ticky Ticky. Teddy carried him off to bed and insisted on Ricky Ticky sleeping under his chin. Ricky Ticky was so well bred to bite or scratch, but as soon as Teddy was asleep, he went off for his nightly walk around the house, and in the dark, he ran up against. Chichandra, the muskrat, creeping round by the wall. Chichandra is a broken-hearted little beast. He whimpers and cheeps all the night, trying to make up his mind to run into the middle of the room, but he never gets there. Don't kill me, said Chichandra, almost weeping. Ricky Ticky, don't kill me. Do you think a snake killer kills muskrats? said Ricky Ticky scornfully. Those who kill snakes get killed by snakes, said Chichandra more sorrowfully than ever. And how am I to be sure that Nag won't mistake me for you some dark night? There's not the least danger, said Ricky Ticky. But Nag is in the garden and I know you don't go there. My cousin Carl, the rat, told me, said Chichandra. And then he stopped. Told you what? Hush, Nag is everywhere. Ricky Ticky, you should have talked to Charles in the garden. I didn't. So you must tell me. Quick, Chichandra, or I'll bite you. Chichandra sat down and cried till the tears rolled off his whiskers. I am a very poor man, he sobbed. I never had spirit enough to run out into the middle of the room. Hush, I mustn't tell you anything. Can't you hear Ricky Ticky? Ricky Ticky listened. The house was as still as still, but he thought he could just catch the faintest scratch scratch in the world, a noise as faint as that of a wasp walking on a window pane. The dry scratch of a snake's scales on brickwork. That's Nag or Nagaina, he said to himself, and he is crawling into the bathroom sluice. You're right, Chichandra. I should have talked to Carl. At this point, he stole off to Teddy's bathroom there was nothing there, and then to Teddy's mother's bathroom. At the bottom of the smooth plaster wall, there was a brick pulled out to make a sluice for the bath water. And as Ricky Ticky stole in by the masonry curb where the bath is put, he heard Nag and Nagaina whispering together outside in the moonlight. When the house is emptied of people, said Nagaina to her husband, he will have to go away. And then the garden will be our own again. Go in quietly and remember that the big man who killed Karait is the first one to bite. Then come out to tell me and we will hunt for Ricky Ticky together. But are you sure that there is anything to be gained by killing the people? Said Nag. Everything. And there were no people in the bungalow. Did we have any mongoose in the garden? So long as the bungalow is empty, we are king and queen of the garden. And remember that as soon as our eggs in the melon bed hatch, as they may tomorrow, 
Our children will need room and quiet. Hmm, I had not thought of that, said Nag. I will go, but there is no need that we should hunt for Ricky Ticky afterward. I will kill the big man and his wife and the child if I can and come away quietly. Then the bungalow will be empty and Ricky Ticky will go. Ricky Ticky tingled all over with rage and hatred at this. And then Nag's head came through the sluice and his five feet of cold body followed it. Angry as he was, Ricky Ticky was very frightened as he saw the size of the big cobra. Nag coiled himself up and raised his head and looked into the bathroom in the dark and Ricky could see his eyes glitter. Now, if I kill him here, Nagina will know. And if I fight him in the open floor, the odds are in his favor. What am I to do? said Ricky Ticky Toffee. Nag moved to and fro, and then Ricky Ticky heard from drinking from the biggest water jar that was used to fill the bath. That is good, said the snake. Now, when Karait was killed, the big man had a stick. He may have that stick still, but when he comes in to bathe in the morning, he will not have a stick. I shall wait here till he comes. Megana, do you hear me? I shall wait here in the cool till daytime. There was no answer from outside, so Ricky Ticky knew Megana had gone away. Nag coiled himself down, coil by coil, round the bulge at the bottom of the water jar, and Ricky Ticky stayed still as death. After an hour, he began to move muscle by muscle toward the jaw. Nag was asleep, and Ricky Ticky looked at his back, wondering which would be the best place for a good hold. If I don't break his back at the first jump, said Ricky, he can still fight. And if he fights, oh, Ricky. He looked at the thickness of the neck below the hood, but that was too much for him and a bite near the tail would only make Nag savage. It must be the head, he said at last. The head above the hood, and when I am once there, I must not let go. Then he jumped. The head was lying a little clear of the water jug under the curve of it, and as his teeth met, Ricky braced his back against the bulge of the red earthenware to hold down the head. This gave him just one second's purchase and he made the most of it. Then he was battered to up and down and round in great circles, but his eyes were red and he held on as the body cart whipped over the floor, upsetting the tin dipper and the soap dish and the flesh brush and the banged against the tin side of the bath. As he held his, he closed his jaws tighter and tighter, for he made sure he would be banged to death. And for the honor of his family, he preferred to be found with his teeth locked. He was dizzy aching and felt shaken in pieces when something went off like a thunder clasp just behind him. A hot wind knocked him senseless and red fire singed his fur. The big man had been wakened by the noise and had fired both barrels of his shotgun into Nag just behind the hood. Ricky Ticky held on with his eyes, his eyes shut. For now, he was quite sure he was dead, but the head did not move. And the big man picked him up and said, it's the mongoose again. Alice, the little chap has saved our lives now. Then Teddy's mother came in with a very white face and saw, and saw what was left of Nag. And Ricky Ticky dragged himself to Teddy's bedroom and spent half the rest of the night shaking himself tenderly 
to find out whether he really was broken into 40 pieces as he fancied. When morning came, he was very stiff, but well pleased with his doings. Now I have Nagina to settle with, and she will be worse than five nags, and there's no knowing when the eggs she spoke of will hatch. Goodness, I must go and see Darcy, he said. And next time we'll find out what happens. There's the end of one of the stakes, but what about the other? And what will happen next? Stay tuned for the next installment. The last part three will be for next time. So you look for part three of the next video of Ricky Tiki Toffee.